Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and welcome to the next in a series of Gaming Rules Quick and Dirty Reviews. In this video, I'm going to be telling you what I think about Dominant Species, designed by Chad Jensen and published by GMT Games. Now, this video was produced thanks to my Patreon campaign, so thank you very much to all of my Patreon supporters for helping make this video possible. And if you do enjoy my content, then please consider supporting me over at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. This is one of the two games that was voted on by my Patreon supporters that I would review in the month of May 2018. Now, the other thing about this game is this is the second printing of the game. The first edition came out, and whilst the game itself was very well received and lots of people liked it, the artwork did come in for some criticism. A lot of people like it, that's fine. I personally didn't, it was very minimalistic, um, but they did, they completely updated all of the graphics and the artwork for all later versions of the game. So this is like the second edition or second printing. None of the rules changed at all. It was just the cosmetic look of all of the artwork, but that's what you see in this video. So the first thing to get out of the way is whether I like this game or not, so that you can just listen to this one word review and then switch off and not listen to anything else. Um, I think this game is absolutely fantastic. I really do. And it's not the kind of game which a lot of people would think that I maybe, maybe don't like. And this, one of the reasons why I like this game is it's published by GMT Games. And GMT Games do very high conflict war game type games. And this is, there is a lot of conflict in this game, but me as a hardcore Euro gamer that doesn't play games with conflict, why do I like it so much? Well, it's done using Euro mechanisms. There's no dice for resolution in this game. You don't attack somebody and then roll a bunch of dice to see whether you win. It's all about the planning of the actions, which you do on this area of the board here, which is done using uh, worker placement, action selection type mechanism, very common to other Euro games. So it has a very nice blend of Euro mechanics but with a very conflict-heavy game. And this is one of the most conflict-heavy game, conflict heavy games and brutal games that I have in my collection, uh, and I do really enjoy playing it. Now, the game can run quite long, okay? So I know some people will disagree with that and say, oh no, we, we managed to play six-player games in two and a half hours. Well, that's great if you're able to do that, but our average playtime for this game with four players is about four hours. And with six players, I think we did it in about four and a half to five hours. So it is a little bit on the long side for a number of people. Um, is it worthy of that time investment? In my opinion, yes, because I think the game is excellent. Now, a few things to mention about the game is one of the reasons why some people don't like the game when they first play it is that the, uh, the domination cards that come out are very, very swingy. Right, so every round, if you go on the domination action, I won't explain too much, you get to play and resolve one of these domination cards. And they are, some people say they're swingy, and I will admit, they are swingy. The effect of them can cause an absolute massive change to the state of the board. And, you know, one player could be doing really well, and then a particular card could come out, and it could, there could be a volcano in the land that they're in, and it could absolutely devastate them. Okay, which sounds really bad, but first of all, the cards are all face up. At the start of each round, the cards are all face up. You see what they are, you see what the effects are. If you want to resolve one of them, you have to put your worker on the domination space. So if you're going first, and there's a really there's a card out there that's gonna absolutely kill you, then you need to go on that space first so that you can deal with that card and hurt somebody else. Also, the example I used where, you know, a volcano completely wipes out a player, that's, well, if they put all of their cubes on one place when there's a volcano there, that's their fault. Um, you do see the cards ahead of time, so you can plan for what's going to happen. Um, there is conflict in the game, and you can attack each other using the competition action, but that is very simply, I'm going to remove one cube from this area because I've attacked you. And that's it. There's no, as I say, there's no dice for combat. The, the brutal nature of the game and where it's really aggressive between the players is not just the competition action. That's a relatively minor effect. It's the way that these cards come out. So yeah, where you choose to blight the land or do the volcano or, or anything else, that can have a massive impact on the game. And when people play it for the first time, if you don't warn them about those cards and say, look, these cards are majorly powerful, these will completely change the game, you need to be aware of them and plan for them. If you don't do that and people just sort of suffer the effects of the card, they're like, oh my god, the cards are way too random. They're not random, as I say, you see what's ahead of time. Um, what else about the game? There's a couple of changes that I make in the game. Now, 
this isn't going to be one of Paul's famous or infamous house rules. Um, there is a well-known house rule that when you're playing with five or six players, you take out the action cards which reduce or increase the number of action pawns that you have. And I always play with that. It makes the game slightly shorter, but also in a game with five or six players, you don't have that many action pawns each. I think it's maybe three. So getting an extra one is a massive advantage. Whereas in a two or three player game, where you start with more action pawns, getting that extra one is nice, but it's not like game breaking. So I generally use that rule. That's not one of my house rules. Um, the other thing that I do is a purely cosmetic thing. On the initiative track, I use the cubes to show the uh, turn order of the players rather than the, uh, the little counters that come with the game because then I can more easily see who's what. And I also put a little cube next to each of the uh, species on the, uh, the animals on the food chain. Again, just to more easily see who's what. So it's a couple of cosmetic changes that I make. Don't make any changes to the actual gameplay itself apart from that one that I mentioned earlier. Now, speaking of the rule book, I always like to cover the rule book in my games. What's good about the rule book, what's bad about the rule book. GMT games have a reputation for doing very, very good rule books. Now, I have a number of GMT games. Their rule books are very good. A lot of them follow the old war game style where you have section 17.3.2, which isn't seen in a lot of modern games. It is clear. Um, this game doesn't have that, okay? This game doesn't have that numbered bullet point system. This rule book is one of the best rule books that I've read. So, uh, you know, props out to all of the people involved in this rule book. It's extremely clear. Will you be able to play the game after buying the game without watching any videos or anything? Yes, you should be able to because this rule book is really, really good. Uh, also, I like to cover the components in my video and the components in this game are pretty exceptional. Um, the wooden pieces, oh, the wooden pieces, but there's no like weird cut pieces or anything else. The colors are all good. Uh, this is again the second edition, so I love the artwork. I think it's great. Uh, the, the cardboard tiles, really thick cardboard. The counters, yeah, okay, the counters are okay. Uh, but one thing I will mention at this point is, I got the game when it first came out, the first printing, and I wasn't happy with the artwork style. And this is in the times when I had a little bit more time on my hands, and I decided to bling up my copy of the game. So I made completely new hexes, um, and this is this is what they look like. Now, now that I've got the second edition of the game, I don't need to use those hexes. Um, I still do, because I, I, I like them, um, but the new ones are, are much better, so I'd be more than happy to play a game with the, with the new printing. But yes, I did bling up my copy of the game originally. So yeah, components really good, rule book really good, gameplay really good. This is a nine out of 10 game for me, if not a 9.5 uh, game. As I say, it is a little bit long. It does play two to six players and it plays six players fantastically. Six players might even be the optimal number of players for the game. But I've played it a number of times with uh, three, four and five, and they're really good too. But with six, obviously it'll be a bit longer, but you do get a lot going on in the game. Okay, so with all of these positive things that I'm saying about the game, why isn't this a 10 out of 10 game for me? And there is only one thing that I don't like about it. And I'm, and I'm not saying that I absolutely hate this part of the game. It's part of the game. I've come to accept it. But this is the part which I feel is a little bit random. And some people will, you know, disagree on the definition of the word random here. But every round you will draw out uh, you'll draw four of these element tokens onto the adaptation, four onto the abundance, and four onto the wanderlust spaces. And the little tiles that get drawn out, they can really change the game. And, you know, again, like the domination cards, they are revealed, and, you know, you can see them, and you can plan them, and, and everything else. But if your particular animal that you're playing really, really likes a certain one, and then that doesn't come out at all, then you can be quite screwed. You do have ways of reacting to that, but I have found for me personally, um, that the, which of these do come out is a, is a random element and it can favor some players uh, over others. It's not a big problem for me. As I said, the game is still a nine, nine and a half out of 10, um, but it is a little bit to be aware of. So what else to say about the game? I don't think there is anything else about it. As I say, I haven't covered the rules of the game, really. I don't generally like to do that in these videos. I try and keep them short and just tell you what I think about the game, which is 
It's absolutely fantastic. But don't take my word for it. Graham Charlton, one of my friends and a Patreon supporter of mine, this is his number one favourite game. So let's have a see what Graham thinks about it. Graham says, it's a multi-layered area control, a constantly evolving board state, intense interaction between players, a perfectly realised theme, and relatively simple rules for a game of its length and internal complexity. There is so much to love in this game. To do well at Dominant Species, you have to pay attention to everything that is going on and never ever get complacent about your board position. It's been my favourite game since shortly after it came out, and I really can't see that changing. So that is what Graham thinks of the game. As he hinted on there, the game does have a lot of complexity in it, but the rules are relatively streamlined. The complexity comes from the decisions that you make and the way that everything interacts together. One thing that does catch people out is, this, is the topic of domination, because whether you have domination in a particular terrain hex is nothing to do with how many cubes you have on there. It's determined by the number of element tokens around that hex and your uh, animal's adaptation to surviving on those elements. However, when the hex is scored and you get points for the hex, that is based on the number of cubes on the hex. So there's effectively, there's two different things that you're keeping track of. There's the domination of the hex and you can dominate a hex even if you have one cube in there and another player has 10 because if your animal is better suited to surviving in that particular terrain, it will have dominance over that hex. But then when it comes to scoring, it's based on the number of cubes in that hex. So yeah, you've got two different things to keep track of, um, which can be a little complicated when you first start learning the game, but it is all thematic and it does work out really well once you get to know it. So anyway, that's everything I think that I think about dominant species. Fantastic game, always enjoy playing it check it out if you get a chance to. And if this has been on your list of games to try, but you've been a little nervous about the, the conflict nature of the game and you're a Euro gamer like me, then don't let that put you off and give it a go. I hope you found this video useful. And as I say, if you enjoy the content that I produce, then please consider supporting the channel at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.